welcome everybody. Um, thank you for signing up and sitting in and uh, coming to be part of this public participation impact the other PPI webinar. Um, my name is Eddie Nason. Uh, I am assistant director here at the Ontario School Support Unit. I've been working in uh, what's called in Canada patient-oriented research for the last uh, five years or so, but I've also worked in uh, research impact assessment and impact evaluation for about the last 10 to 15 years. Um, so that's my background in this area. Thanks. And uh, my name is Emily Nicholas Angle, and I, as as we say often, uh, I, I would say I wear two hats, one being that I am someone with pretty significant lived experience. Uh, I like to say I've been through ORs, ERs, MRIs, and every acronym in between. Um, and as well, I'm someone who's been working in the realm of patient-oriented research and patient um, and public involvement in um, research for about 10 years now, um, both as someone who's um, a sort of patient partner myself, but now more so as someone who looks at strategy and the how um, of patient and public engagement and also um, uh, considers some of uh, research on patient and public engagement. So, so yeah, coming at this from a, a couple of different perspectives today. Yep. And um, although this is the first time that we presented together, we are now going under the officially. moniker, uh, officially going under the moniker of EN squared, since we're both uh, have the same initials. Yeah. So this is the first ever EN squared presentation. There you go. Hopefully not the last. Yep. So uh, what we want to cover uh, in this webinar is firstly a bit of going over some of the ground rules around what the webinar is going to be and how, how we can do this. Um, and then trying to get into sort of a few different questions around posing questions to, to you that we might or might not be able to answer through the webinar. Um, what can we do right now in terms of um, PPI, uh, patient and public engagement and involvement impact work? What can't we do? What are the things where we, we don't have the abilities? Where are the pinch points? Where are the things where we think there's a, an opportunity to move forward or issues that we really need to deal with? And then how might we actually move forward with this as a concept? Uh, but to start with, we wanted to make sure that it wasn't just us talking. Um, so we wanted to find out a bit about who is on this uh, webinar. Uh, so we're going to launch a couple. We've got three basically quick polls to do here. Um, so you'll see something coming up on your screen in a second. Um, firstly, asking about where you are, then around sort of which group you sort of mainly sit within. So just think about which hat you might wear uh, more often than not. Uh, and then whether you have any experience of impact assessment uh, of research. So we'll start off with where are you located. So that you can see that the majority of people here are from, from Europe, uh, with a significant proportion from the Americas, a little bit of people, a little collection of, uh, of uh, people from Africa and Asia. And I, I think this is good because what we're talking about is pretty international. Hopefully, yeah. Pretty international issue. Yeah. Um, so thanks for that. We're going to now ask about which group you think you sit in. Okay, so hopefully again, you can you can see these um, poll results where we have uh, quite a good spread yeah. of people from the research world, people with lived experience, some people who are working in the decision-making world, um, some people who are working as health professionals, and a whole bunch of people who are identifying as other, and I wish we had the capacity to come in and explore that, but we'll explore yeah. that. Well, another. if you want, um, with if you ask a question, or if you then please identify what group maybe you feel like you do belong yeah. to that wasn't here. Feel um, free to add it to the chat box. Yeah, exactly. So. Okay, so one last question in this page. Um, we're working you hard, mm -hmm. uh, which is around what your experience is of impact assessment of research. Okay, so as you can see here that we've got a, a bit of a distribution where about a third of the people here have no experience of impact assessment of research, uh, nearly half have some experience, and then the remaining 20% uh, have either a fair experience or a lot of experience. Um, so there'll be some things that will be new to yeah. a lot of people, some things that won't be new, and uh, hopefully yeah. we'll be able to have some really good discussions and get some ideas from people who've never thought about it or some people who've thought about yeah. it a lot. In terms of ground rules, um, what we want to do is we want to, to identify that there are some terminology issues, as in every area of work that we've yeah, ever that been we involved do. in, yeah. um, that we wanted to just sort of give some clarity around uh, for core bits of terminology. Um, and so one of the things we wanted to, to do was to ask um, your thoughts on, the, on these particular 
terms. So uh, PPI as patient and public involvement, obviously that's the standardized uh, lexicon in the UK um, and in a number of other areas around the world. Uh, and the definition here being research being carried out with or by members of the public rather than to, about or for them. Um, Patient-oriented research, which is what we use in Canada. Um, so that's what Emily and I are sort of stuck with. Uh, and the definition here being engaging patients, caregivers and families as partners in the research process. It's a very similar kind of thing. Uh, a clarifying definition here for Canada, which is patient. Um, patient in patient-oriented research is a broad term. It's not just patients who are people sitting uh, with the lived experience. It's also the caregivers and family members who have lived experience of working within the system as well. Um, so although we say patient in Canada, we often mean everybody who could possibly mm -hmm. have some lived experience of that issue. That's right. Um, and then research impact. Uh, and this is a definition uh, that sort of builds on a lot of the research impact work over the years. Um, and it's from the, uh, the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK, but it's a really nice thing, I think, that says, that identifies research impact as the demonstrable contribution that excellent research makes to society and the economy. So the idea being that impacts are things that are, are societal and economic, but it can involve academic impact, uh, which would be things that move the academic world further forward. So has the research been able to, to change the way that we think about new questions, et cetera, uh, economic or societal impact or both. Um, so it's, it's thinking about impact as quite a broad thing that the research can have uh, in terms of both improving research and, and future academe and also changing the way that society works. Um, and we're now going to launch a quick poll and this is quite an experimental one. Um, we should be able to still launch it. Uh, basically asking um, what are your thoughts about those concepts, PPI, patient oriented research, patient and research impact. Uh, if you can click on it the, the checkbox if you kind of agree with what the, the definition is and we can sort of start to think about you know that will help us identify where there's contentious issues yeah. um, in we the things that we're talking this. about so I'm going to launch that now just to say that um, generally very good agreement with PPI which yeah. is, uh, and it shows how established it is as a concept which and is I, good. I wonder if that's to do too with there's a lot of people here from Europe where that term might be used more than some of Yep. Canada. Um, less so around patient oriented research, but again, that might be a sign that perhaps people don't, don't work with it very often and therefore are not so sure about what it is. Um, half agreeing with the, the concept of patient, and I know this is. I'm not surprised big, at all, yeah. I think that's probably about. <laughs> that's, that's actually probably higher higher than I thought it would be. Yeah, probably reminiscent of what's happening in Canada. Yeah. And then significantly higher than I thought it would be around research yeah. impact. 85% um, of people agreeing with that as a sort of definition, which is great because it's it's will help us in terms of how we sort of frame the conversation yeah. now. Excellent. So thank you. Uh, we're going to hide that okay. um, poll. And then hopefully it'll go back. Okay. And then we'll just um, outline the approach for the session. Now. Yeah. So one of the things we really want to make clear is that you know we're trying to be a little bit less formal with this presentation and um, and really have it be. Um, what we call mutual learning. So we've just been learning a lot about you guys and then hopefully we will also share um, a lot of uh, some of what we know, but also hopefully frame some questions more so uh, than, than have a lot of answers. We just want to make that very clear up front and that uh, we're kind of going to lay the landscape a little bit and discuss some of the, as you mentioned, contentious issues. Um, and also, I also, we can also speak from some of our personal experience, um, so not just some of the theory what's out there, but what our experience has been kind of on the ground working in this area. Um, and, uh, and that we are also going to be moving back and forth between Eddie and myself between the presentation, so we'll switch back and forth during slides, but we also might both talk about some slides, so you're going to hear our voices come back and forth. Please make any comments if you're having trouble with the audio. Yeah? Great. So if we can move to the next slide, Richard. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, why we need to measure impact. And I, I added this sort of little cartoon here because I do think we need to think about this thing. That we can't just say like, oh, well, we just need we just need to measure it. In fact, one of the ways we can help define what we need to measure is by thinking about why we need to measure it. So if you could just move to the next slide. Uh, Richard, if you can move to, thank you very much. So um, we also know sort of from the, uh, the evidence or from what's out there, some of the literature, and this is, this is from Canada, but there is, you know, there's limited evidence for this clear role and the scope of 
this idea of patient engagement and research. And it's kind of a resulting in a catch-22. You know, if you don't have um, evidence about its impact, then it's not clear necessarily that it should have a role. And so we need to consider this sort of this catch-22 situation, I think, as we frame this. Um, and also the current evaluation frameworks have I mean, almost every paper I read says some statement like evaluation frameworks and, um, and enough evaluation data is are, are lacking, um, and especially in terms of anything standard that we can use across the board. Um, so if you could move to the next slide. Thanks. So one way we could start thinking about this, I think, is to consider why we're doing it in the first place. Um, and so instead of me trying to come up with a comprehensive list of why we are doing this, I just took one list. Because I think we could sit here all day probably and come up with the nuances of, of all the different reasons we're doing it. So I took one list here and this divides it up. This is from Alberta, but it divides it up into, you know, what the benefits that we're assuming in a sense are. Some of this, you might debate whether it's assumed or not, but what the benefits are to both research and researchers and then to patients. Now, some of things in here um, are going to be more about sort of the process and about the effects on the individuals involved. But I think what we get from looking at this is what we're kind of assuming that patient-oriented research um, PPI does. Um, and so if we start from there, we, we can start to get a sense of, okay, then what are we trying to actually find or measure what are we assuming um, is going to be happening? And that can help us define then um, why we're actually needing to measure in the first place. So if you, you can, I use that just to kind of give a ground for the, the next slide. If you could move to the next slide, please. So you could say that within those kind of um, assumptions about the benefits, um, we're kind of got some, you know, you could say we have reasons for doing PPI that are sort of the moral reasons or the ethical reasons. There's some things that fall under sort of obligations to taxpayers. Whatever, whatever the reasons are, I think we need to consider within that, are we fulfilling those goals? Are we fulfilling um, the goals of engagement in research? And without measuring impact, we can't really um, assess that. So is PPI accomplishing basically what we said it would? I think very practically, we have accountability to who the funders, and, and you could consider those funders to be the research organizations themselves, or even potentially in, for instance, Canada and, and places with public uh, we funded research um, that the funders are the, the public. Um, is our engagement approach um, of involving these select patient partners, as we talked about in patient um, engagement, patient-oriented research, we're kind of connecting very specific certain individuals with projects and having their voices. How we need to be able to see whether that actually works as a method to have um, uh, an effect and impact on the whole patient population, right? Because there's some assumptions there. And then of course, knowledge for knowledge is sake, which I think that's actually a contentious issue in and of itself, whether we should be funding that kind of research, but it is something to actually, and that's why I put question marks with all these, just so you'll oh, yeah. see. Again, this is not meant to be a comprehensive list of all the reasons to measure impact, but it, it is important to consider. Um, yeah, you can go on to the next slide there, I think. Or, yeah. Addy, did you want to add something was, to that? What I was going to say is that I think that's, that's a key point I made. That yeah. we, what we're doing here is we're not telling people, well, if you came on expecting us to tell you how to do impact assessment of PPI, I'm really sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's probably not what's going to happen. Oh, we just lost 50% right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, no, this is a chance to sort of think about, we, we have to think about this mm -hmm. on a regular basis. And so these are some of our thoughts and some of the thoughts of the system. Uh, and what we want to do is try and collate this in one place so that we can all move forward with this. Um, exactly. And I think that's where the next slides come into play, which is one of the most important things I found, um, or, or something I've come up against recently, is there sometimes seems to be a reticence to want to discuss things that are complex or or, um, or contentious. And, and uh, measuring impacts falls into that in many ways. And so sometimes the uh, sort of focus on our individual projects, I know in the work I do, means that we don't stop to reflect on the bigger landscape or the taking up a, a sort of a, a bird's eye view of what's going on overall. And I think what we want to get into today is why it is important that we do that, why we do have to think about this, even if it is tricky, even if it is contentious. And so I'm going to jump right into a few of the issues we come up against very quickly, I think, as we start to consider measuring impact. 
The first being this idea that, well, I think the automatic with wanting to measure impact is kind of doing this cost benefit. Like, is the impact worth the costs of participation? But what does that mean when we're considering something like uh, patient and public involvement in research? This is taken from a paper I really like, um, but basically this idea that how can you assess whether the benefits are worth the cost when defining at all what a benefit even is in terms of um, in terms of involving patients in the public in research, and what what does a cost mean? I mean, we certainly can't use some sort of single um, monetary uh, measure to deduce whether something is or how much something costs. Now, in this article, they actually do come up with a framework to kind of assess, but but in general, I think that complexity is is uh, really difficult to navigate. And if you could go to the next slide just to dig into this a little bit more. If you could just go, thank you. So just what I'm, I'm trying to sort of emphasize here is that because we lack an appropriate framework um, and something I'll get into later, the lack of really um, recording even what's going on in a lot of uh, the work in PPI, we don't really have a good idea of what all of the variables are and how to assess the cost and the benefit um, and as well, what would it, um, er, as well, there's a, there's a lot taken for granted, and I think that's what I was trying to get at when I talked about the reasons for doing impact assessment, is that we do a, right now take a lot for granted, and to actually reinforce why we're doing it in the first place, we really need to consider um, to consider uh, uh, what we're, me or what to measure. Um, Eddie, did you want to add anything there? Uh, so I think we'll, we'll talk about some of these other these uh, mm -hmm. some of the issues that are identified in here as well that we talk about uh, relevant to research impact assessment in general um, that I think are more generalised than just the effectiveness of PPI. But I think that there's some special issues around PPI because it's a a different way of doing yeah. work. Yeah, uh, doing our research. So. And and one thing I want to emphasize, which was on the last slide as well, is this idea of what if we did find that the so-called costs um, were not uh, worth the benefit that we received. What would that mean? Does that mean if we're doing this for sort of moral or ethical or sort of democratic reasons, then does that even matter? Mm -hmm. um, those sort of philosophical questions then start to come up, right? And so I think that's, that's um, one of the big questions we need to consider as we do impact measurement is what if we do find that there is an impact? How does that affect what, we, um, what we're doing now? Okay, next slide, please. Can you move to the next slide there? Thank you. Um, one thing I've actually heard sort of more anecdotally perhaps, but um, that I come up is that when I talk about impact assessment, people are sort of like, well, why is there so much focus on impact assessment here when we're, if you consider other methodology and research or other, if I call it, I call it your types of research, so um, approaches to research, we don't have the pressure to sort of say, well, does it work? And, and we should be showing that the that's this type of research works or that there's these impacts. And in terms of a systematic way, we don't do that necessarily across the board, right? And so I think it's sort of like, well, why here do we have to put this emphasis on if we're not going to systematically do it for every type of research? And people, especially patients and, and people who are involved sort of think, look, well, why is it particularly um, that we have scrutiny in this in this area? I think this is particularly important as well because this is an international group on this webinar um, that this is very different in different countries mm -hmm. like the, the the way that different countries systematically measure impacts of research is very different for different countries and what they do so I think this also plays into it in the particularly in Canada yeah, for example. Exactly. Um, next slide please. And one thing I think is, um, it's another thing I think is uh, particularly in some ways obvious but um, but also worth pointing out is that basically this idea that well guys we're never going to create an evaluation framework which uh, captures the complexity uh, that goes on in PPI and basically I've taken a something from involved here but this is supposed to be sort of a general map of, of how we do engagement or deliberative engagement here and the idea is that there are so many variables in each time we sort of do a research project or do PPI, we need to consider, you know, 
the separate purpose and what is the process going to look like in this case and who are the players that are going to be involved and what those relationships are like and what's the context and therefore how could we possibly compare um, given all of those variables and the complexity um, of sort of interactions that go on in a project, how can we have a framework or um, an analysis that's going to be applicable every time and that we're going to be able to sort of compare um, and, and consider, you know, patient-oriented research as a whole or PPI as a whole if we're measuring impact. Um, as well, this plays into the idea, how could we possibly map then, given that complexity, how can we possibly map what's going on in a project to the actual impacts? You know, there's too many pieces moving here. Um, so that's another sort of issue of people, or a pushback sometimes that people say about why we're not measuring or why we can't. Um, can we move to the next one, please? Next slide. Now this one, um, this one I think is, I find particularly resonant for me as someone who is a person with experience who's involved in research, who sometimes has questions arise which um, maybe if you've been doing research for a long time, you sort of stop questioning, but the actual framework that all of this is happening in right now, so even us presenting with Cochrane in uh, an office that's you know, funded by the Ontario Sports Support Unit, all of this is happening in a framework which is what I'll revisit later as kind of like a top-down engagement um, of, of us and a framework that is institutional. And so if we're coming up with these um, procedures for measuring impact, that whole system, which the measurement will occur in and how we're going to assess those outcomes is really by definition not defined by the patients um, and people with lived experience, even if they help us come up with um, even if they help us come up with sort of what impact measures are, the whole, um, the whole process of it is in fact guided by those institutions. And I think it's something we need to consider more broadly in patient-oriented research and when we consider what is sufficient um, involvement of people with lived experience and, um, and also, you know, there's some interesting stuff about the difference between patient-led research and kind of this patient-oriented research, right? But it's definitely something we want to consider and that, I like this cartoon because this is sometimes what it feels like, you know, people want to engage you and they, but they're still applying structures which are very ingrained and very institutional and sort of um, uh, top-down. Uh, I think this, this has been a big challenge for the, for for me particularly, I think personally within uh, assessing PPI, uh, assessing patient-oriented research, is that the way we built all the research impact systems, which I think was pretty interesting and, and useful, but was developed for research funders. Like that it was very much set up from the point of view of a research funder. Um, and so I think there was a need to, uh, to, to think about this in a slightly different way, because as Emily says, this is about, you know, we, we're kind of crowbarring, we're trying to sort of force this into a, the, square peg into the round hole um, with an assumption that we'll still be able to get something useful out of it at the end. Yeah. Um, so we move to the next slide. Yeah. Okay, I'll let you start this one. Yeah, so the, the, the other issue that I think that Emily's kind of brought up already is this concept of public good versus publicly good. Uh, and so what I mean here is that the idea that um, things that are public goods are things that we do because we think it's worthwhile doing. There's a moral, there's a, an inclusion imperative that, that suggests we should be doing it. Um, versus things that are publicly good is that we've got some sort of way of showing to others that there's a, an evidence base that this is worthwhile. Um, and I think there's a, this is a big issue for PPI and for patient oriented research in terms of thinking about how much do we think of each of those issues is important in what we do. Um, if there is an inclusion imperative, is that going to shape how we do our impact assessment? Do we have to think about things differently in terms of measuring impact and assessing impact if we're saying that actually it's worthwhile doing for the sake of doing it because it's important ethically and morally and uh, we, we think it's a, a, a significant part of the research world these days. Uh, and I think we're going to revisit some of this as well as we go. So yeah. as you can see, as we promised, we're going to raise maybe more questions than we said. Exactly. Um, yeah, apologies for not answering all these questions. Yeah. Just setting, setting them up for Exactly. For but as I want to reiterate, we think that reflecting and framing these questions is actually a very important part of this process and something which we might not do enough. So that's yeah. why we're excited about this opportunity today. Yeah. Okay. I think the next slide. Yeah, if we move to the next slide. Um, so... One thing that Emily mentioned earlier is this idea of sort of the, you know, the, the issue of accountability to people. Um, and 
when it comes to research impact assessment, uh, it's, I'm happy to say we have actually thought of that. Um, so many years ago when uh, developing sort of the approaches to research impact assessment, we kind of went back to this concept of first principles and thought about, okay, so why is it that people might want to understand the impact of research? Uh, and essentially came up with this concept called the four A's, uh, which is um, the sort of four main reasons why people kind of do impact assessment of research. So the, the first of these, I'll start on the right hand side with advocacy. Uh, the idea there being people might do impact assessment because they want to say, we're doing great stuff, you should totally keep in line, keep funding us to do great stuff. Uh, common for groups like research charities, for example, to, to identify the best things they do and then sort of talk about how great it is and how people should really continue investment. Um, second issue, which is where I think we've moved to these days, is this issue of accountability, which is that whether you're a charity or a public fund or a private funder, there's somebody else who's putting money into the system and they want to understand that you've used their money wisely. Um, in the past, we've tended to think about that from a process point of view. Did we spend it the way we said we'd spend it? Uh, and I think now what we're thinking about is the idea of, are we getting the impacts we said we would get for it? So can we be accountable for the money going in by saying, okay, well, when you put money into this, we've done useful things that have had the kind of impacts that you wanted to have. The next level uh, on the, from this is this concept of analysis at the top. Uh, and that's the idea that uh, as a research funder, uh, we want to really understand what works and what doesn't. Uh, we want to have a better idea about what is impactful and how we support things to be impactful. Uh, and so by doing impact assessment, we can start to get a better understanding of uh, comparing different met methods of funding, comparing different ways of supporting people when they are funded. Uh, so this is this concept of analysis and learning from it. And then finally, where there is some traction these days is this concept of allocation, which is if we know what might be impactful or things that are impactful or people that are impactful, is that going to shape the way that we give out money in the future for research? So can we allocate based on this concept of impact un with a, uh, an understanding of how impact assessment works? Um, so those, those are the four A's and that's sort of the conceptualization of, of why people do impact assessment. And I think that's, and that's, I think that's sort of interesting and relevant to PPI as well. Mm -hmm. And also potentially contentious given the last contentious issues we discussed. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so if we can move to the next slide. Um, this is now getting into this concept of um, what can we do right now uh, and I wanted to, talk, to start talking about the, what can we do in terms of impact evaluation or impact assessment of research um, and because we're on this wonderful sort of international webinar uh, I, I wanted to use a thing, that, a little graphic that I created for a presentation a few years back um, talking about the difference in different countries. So research impacts assessment evaluation is now involved, is now included in lots of different countries around the world. It's become a, a kind of a thing that everybody's trying to work out how to do. Uh, but people have taken different approaches to it. Um, the figure on the left shows this, this sort of graph of a high impact assessment at the top versus low impact assessment. So are people assessing impact or not? Uh, versus the concept along the side, the x-axis there of high impact planning or low impact planning, which is are you trying to support people to have an impact. Uh, and so what you tend to see uh, as somebody who is looking at this comparing the UK um, and Canada is that, for example, the UK does a lot of work on impact assessment, a lot of work on working out when we did do research, did something happen from it. Uh, Canada has taken sort of the opposite approach, which is when we fund research, how can we try and get the researchers and those teams to have an impact uh, without necessarily understanding what that impact was later in the day. Um, so we see a difference in the, the approaches. The other thing about the approaches that are taken in impact assessment, research impact assessment right now, is there tends to be two uh, main streams. They tend to either be metric driven, so the idea that you can count something and then you can look at the counts and make a nice graph of it, or they're narrative driven. So the idea that you want to be able to tell the story of how your research work got through to the impact that it had. Um, there are some examples of where you get a bit of metric and a bit of narrative, uh, but they tend to sort of align with those sorts of approaches. Um, I will say this is still contentious within the research community. Emily and I were reading a, a wonderful blog from last year, yeah. um, two years ago now, because it's it 2020. Was, think, yeah. Yes, now it's 2020, um, where uh, people were talking about uh, one of the events that, uh, Adam, I know that you're on this webinar, uh, you were involved in setting up the Oxford meeting uh, and the idea that 
it's still a contentious issue when researchers and other groups come together uh, in the research community to talk about impact assessment. People aren't really sure what it means. They aren't sure whether it's the right thing to do. They're not sure that their work fits into it. Um, there, as one researcher described it, if uh, simple. Yeah, if it's uh, if it's simple, uh, if it's done as a simple approach, it can drive a lot of bollocks with the uh, terminology. Air, air quotes. They're air quotes. So I'm not saying, oh, yeah, somebody else saying bollocks, not me. Um, but yeah, the idea that this is this is still contentious within the research community, so we shouldn't be overly surprised that it's contentious within the PPI research community and the PPI community more generally. Yeah. Um, if we move to the next slide. Um, so I talked a little bit about what we can do with uh, evaluating the impact of research. The other side of impact evaluation and impact assessment for PPI is where are we in terms of evaluating sort of the process of patient partnership and PPI and, and patient engagement and patient-oriented research? And I think that what you see there is you actually see quite a lot of movement on the process research. There's a lot of work going on around different ways to evaluate. Did we do this appropriately? Were people engaged in a way that wasn't um, tokenistic? Did we do this in a way that actually met the needs of different patient partners and others in the research, other stakeholders in that process? Um, but the focus has tended to be there. And I think part of that is a, is a subset of the fact that when we've done evaluations of, of patient partnership, it started off in the, the world of healthcare and healthcare delivery. And so we, what we really wanted to understand was, okay, was this uh, uh, people doing appropriate ways to bring people into the process? Um, so we've sort of taken a few things and moved them across. So for example, the public and patient engagement evaluation tool uh, out of McMaster University in Canberra here in Ontario um, has been a fantastic tool for, for helping those in the healthcare system uh, do evaluation of whether their patient public and public and patient engagement is working in the way they thought it would um, and is now trying to be a moved across to the concept of research and whether we can still use the same approaches. Um, there's work going on on the right hand side of that wonderful picture at the Centre of Excellence on Partnership and Patients in the Public with patients, on patients in the public in uh, Montreal, uh, who've developed sort of an, an evaluation toolkit uh, looking at all the different approaches to evaluating PPI uh, and patient partnership. Uh, again, very focused on process. Uh, and then there's work going on in places like Picori and Involve. So I included the Picori work there here, um, sort of looking at how they evaluate their own work. Um, one of the things that is interesting here is that when you read the literature that's out there around PPI evaluation, uh, when it talks about impact evaluation, as Emily mentioned earlier, the, the conversation doesn't tend to be, here's a good way of doing it. It tends to be, we don't have enough and we don't know what it is and we need to do it better. Um, one thing I just want to add here too is that there isn't this sort of, it's not totally mutually exclusive, I think, the depth, the idea of the process um, of, or impacts and or an evaluation and that sort of outcomes and um, impact later on, as it were, especially when you look back at what we're assuming are the benefits of patient and public involvement, which are often that there are benefits to the people involved. And I think we want to consider whether that is one of the impacts and that's something which a lot of the time is measured during the process. What did, how did people feel? Like, how did they feel included? How did their understanding change? Did their health literacy change? All of those things, which we do actually do a bit more evaluation on currently. And those also could be considered in a sense impacts of the, um, of the research and, and to some perspectives, I think, sufficient impacts as it were. Um, so if we had a nice Venn diagram, I think there'd be some sort of yeah, overlap there. Overlap. How do we not have a Venn diagram? Oh, we have limited time. <laughs> yeah, okay. Christmas holidays, there New Year's, um, small children. I, that's that's ready. Anything. They'll do that to you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if we can move to the next slide. Um, so one of the things I want, wanted to do was to, to identify as well what we can't do right now. Um, so there are some we talked about some of the contentious issues. There are some major problems here around uh, assessing research for uh, PPI. Uh, one of those being the issue of solid metrics. What are the measures that we would use? If we, if we are trying to develop something that would measure the impact, what on earth would we actually collect and measure for it? Uh, how can we do that at the right time? Uh, what are the biases that we have in terms of choosing what those metrics are? Uh, I think that's one of the major challenges that comes up. And there's a great paper by Trish Greenhush um, looking at uh, the research excellence framework, 
work that was done, uh, impact narratives that were done around community-based research and uh, identifying that actually lots of the things that we measure in those are very process driven uh, and we don't necessarily have a lot in there that measures things that might be impacts uh, because of the time is the timeline issues because of the things that we think are important particularly for example to the to the actual research excellence framework rather than to the that group um, if we can go back back, slide, back, slide. back slide, a couple of slides there I think we jumped forward accidentally we're still on the what can't we do slide 80 That's right. there we go uh, the, yes, the next issue is around attribution of impacts to research. Emily mentioned this. Um, we, we are very bad at identifying um, whether a piece of research was the thing that made the change or impacts that we said it did. Uh, we are fairly certain that it's not one bit of work or even the work of one researcher or the work of one university or the work of one university or one research funder. Um, so we, we probably can't do something where we identify whether the there's actual attribution to the research we're talking about. Yeah, and I think this is important to consider, especially that this is a, an issue, obviously, which is across the board in research. So so this is something that's being um, addressed in, in various uh, ways. And one of the interesting things I found is I've started to try to go look back, not so much at just patient-oriented research, but how are we trying to map evidence being translated into policy um, and sort of the bedside sometimes it's called or um, in the real world how are we mapping that currently um, and and you know there's not a lot of understanding in that way either and that speaks to the fact that we're now actually moving towards engaging stakeholders not just patients and public but policymakers um, people who write uh, or who um, work in healthcare and, and trying to understand how all these players interact and how they use research. And I think that is one of the things that we'll get to later when we say, how do we address this, is by doing more research with broad stakeholders to understand um, this. One example, I always, I, I've been trying to look for something, and please share if you have, if you have anything like this, where I thought, well, what's a tangible um, aspect of patient-oriented research or subset that we could then maybe map to see how it correlates with maybe policy? And I thought, well, maybe if we looked for, I realize these aren't always patient-driven exactly, but you know, patient-reported outcomes and whether the use of patient-reported um, outcomes in research actually seems to translate more into implementation and policy. I was like, maybe somebody did a meta-analysis and looked at all the one of the problems is there's not very good reporting on being able to find which papers really, you know, did good involvement of patients or understanding of patient reported outcomes, let alone how would we map that. But but it is something to consider. And even during the last political election, the election which happened in Canada, um, there was an interesting study that came out of Canada, which did involve patients around pharmacare. And the only time I heard it referred to um, on uh, with with one of the politicians, she actually cited and mentioned a outcome which I know was defined by patients, which was having this program helped um, me feel like I could more easily get by, as it were. And that was what she used to sort of sell it um, in her in her talk about the reasons for pharmacare. And I thought, well, that's an interesting, you know sort of example, anecdotal, around how can we start to see where these things are, are entering the political world? How are we going to map um, and, and attribute the impacts of research to the actual um, policy change or, or implementation? I think it's, it's a really important thing to consider. Yeah, uh, going to the last one of these uh, point here is collating information across PPI evaluations. Um, I think you know, Emily mentioned the idea of complexity. Uh, that's one of the reasons we can do it. We're trying to compare apples and oranges. We're, we're looking at different types of research, different types of evaluation approaches. Uh, and so I don't think we're very good right now at working at how do we look at things for PPI in general rather than for particular projects. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. Um, so we wanted to do a quick poll. We wanted to talk about where are the pinch points. So what are the things that we think are important to, to think about next? Um, and so we will get, a, again, a very quick poll. So for those of you who are still awake, um, about which of the um, following potential impacts uh, you might think you might want to know about. If you were thinking about assessing an impact assessment of, of PPI and your work in this area or generally, are there if you were to choose a top three of this list, 
which ones would you choose? And this is not a comprehensive list. I know that there would be a bunch of things that would be others on this. This is just an illustrative. Here are some things that people think about in general. Um, which are the ones that you think might be important to you? Just to see if there is anything, you know, we, if we all center on the same sort of three top three or the top two, that would be an interesting finding. What you can see from those results uh, is that we, we tend to want to know the relevance of impacts to patients and the public and impacts on health outcomes. I think that's good to, uh, good to identify. Um, and issues around well-being, where we might not be able to identify or describe it as well, uh, might not be as important. Impacts on healthcare costs might be less important. The way we deliver healthcare uh, might be less important. So I think this is the sorts of ways that we can start to um, think about the things we need to what we need to investigate when it comes to the impact assessment world um, and how we might go about doing that. Um, so we'll move on from that poll. So I'm going to hide that. And if we can move to the next, oh no, just quickly before we move to the next slide. Um, this is one of the things we wanted to talk about here was the idea that what we want to measure and what we should measure might be different. Um, so doing that thing and identifying things we want to measure are impacts on health outcomes and impact, uh, relevance of impacts might be really important things that we want to know. Uh, and things that we should measure might be issues around, um, is this actually changing the way that healthcare works? Uh, which is perhaps identified as less important. Uh, so can we do something that's similar to this, the, the James Lind Alliance approach, where we actually sit down and we identify what are the top issues um, that we might want to know and also that we really should be looking at? Are there ways for us to try and work out this sort of thing in a different way to the, the, the way we've done in back assessment in the past? Next slide. Next slide. Um, so one of the key issues here in pinch points is whose values are we reflecting in PPI impact assessment? Um, I love this little cartoon from XKCD uh, about somebody who's a computer programmer uh, writing incredible code to solve an impossible problem um, and they do it and if they're an academic, uh, if you're in the academic world what happens is if you get to write uh, a number of papers, a thesis and every textbook gets your work uh, and if you work in the business world, it's great because you stop something being uh, jamming up. Uh, but actually, all you've done now is you know, you're going to do something completely different because you fixed a problem and it doesn't matter how you did it. Uh, and I think this is an important issue in terms of whose values we think about in terms of PPI impact assessment. Because are we thinking about academia? Are we thinking about the policy world? Are we thinking about the patient partner world? How do we and make sure that the multiple values are in incorporated into this so we're not just looking at this from one point of view? Go to the next slide. Um, I mentioned timelines a little bit earlier. Uh, timelines definitely a pinch, a pinch point um, because uh, when it comes to impacts, they don't tend to happen straight away from research. Uh, and so this cartoon of uh, people shutting down their magic green project, uh, perhaps a little bit too early. Uh, now that they've got their wonderful beanstalk out their window. Uh, I think this is an issue for research impact assessment is that we, know, we, we might not know which research is impactful at the time we do the impact assessment. So how can we think about um, looking at PPI in a way that actually acknowledges the sorts of things we want to have happen might not happen straight away. So we're not measuring things in the wrong way and getting rid of stuff that actually does what we do want it to do, but in a longer timeline. Next slide. And then um, I'll just sort of quickly touch on this because we've already sort of talked about it, but basically this idea that as we do go about maybe framing this whole um, discussion around what are the impacts, why are we measuring all of these things, the idea that currently we are still doing that in what might be called sort of that top-down engagement way. So we're partnering with patients, but it's within these institutions. It's being invited by the academics. It's being sort of said, oh, let's, here's the framework we use. How do we change it? And then what about this idea of, you know, kind of patient-led or the community-led um, engagement, which comes much more from the bottom, as it sort of shows here, um, and, and how can we make that part of our endeavor as opposed to just kind of starting from where we already are at or from the institutional um, uh, start, starting point? So we can move on to the next yep, slide. Yeah, next slide. So these are the last, the last two. I promise there's a chance to, to have a bit of a discussion as well. Um, we wanted to just set up some thoughts around what we think might be ways to move forward with this. One is to look at uh, existing approaches, 
to research impact assessment and comparing and contrasting PPI research with non-PPI. So if we did use our existing structures and said, here's some PPI research that we impact assess in this way and we also addressed other research, we start to understand what biases we have in the way we're doing impact assessment that might bias either for or against PPI. Um, one is this concept of meta-analysis. So we've got lots of PPI evaluations going on. How can we do something that collects those together and looks at, it, at what impacts we might then say are really important for using impact, and impact assessment more generally? Uh, the, the possibility of returning to first principles, building this new framework um, and identifying what are the shared or agreed upon values for PPI. So how can we build an impact assessment framework that actually doesn't think about it from the research funder point of view, but from the sort of shared value point of view. And I think that extends into my first point here, which is just around, I think within those of us who do PPI um, and are on the ground doing it, we really need to be reflecting on this as part of our actual process of engaging patients. Um, one of the projects I'm working on right now, for instance, we talk about why are we evaluating um, what we're doing here and what some of these contentious issues even are. I talked about it with some of the patients who are involved, talked about why we're doing, we're using um, the tool that came out of McMaster, Julia Abelson, uh, the PP, P, Pete, <laughs> PP, um, and, uh, and discussing why there's limitations to that and not. And that's helping me get a sense of, you know, some of the perspectives on this, albeit anecdotal. But the idea is to go into the last point, is that we're going to then record that and um, hopefully write up, you know, what we discussed and how it shaped what we're doing. As well, I think what's key and what's very clear from the literature when we talk about the lack of there being impact is that the actual reporting currently on what we're doing itself um, within projects where um, PPI is going on, because sometimes it's not necessarily framed, the whole project isn't necessarily framed as a patient-oriented research project. And so some of that gets lost in whatever is written up. There are reporting frameworks out there that now might provide an opportunity to kind of standardize some of what we're reporting so that, in as Eddie said, if we need to come back later, if we want to do things like meta-analyses, and I think one of the key things here is if we want to look at what are the variables and factors that are at play here, we need to have on record, you know, who were the players and what was going on in, in individual projects so that even to give us the potential, even if it's difficult, the potential to map um, what's going on to, um, to outcomes. And so, for instance, uh, the GRIP and the uh, Reprise are two tools that, um, that we can use to do that. 